While we stand for justice, dignity, honor, and respect of the Black life, all too often, the names of Black women senselessly murdered by law enforcement are glazed over. We have a duty and a responsibility as Black women and hosts of a podcast that advocate and amplify the voices of Black women to bring awareness and shed light on the sisters who are no longer with us. We will always and forever say her name. Welcome to Melanated Conversations. Our narrative and our perspective. Here on the podcast, we are amplifying the voices of Black women and sharing their powerful stories of transformation. I'm Tyrion. And I'm Yana. Let's start the show. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Melanated Conversations. I am your co-host, Tarian. And I'm your co-host, Yana. Yes, um, we are back with uh, another installment of our series, Say Her Name, where we will be sharing some more stories of Black women who have been taken from us senselessly. So, um, but before we share some more stories, yeah, I'm just going to share some words. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to just quickly just say this before we get started. So y'all, um, as probably since in our previous, um, episode and previous segment of this installment of the series, say her name, it's been very emotional for us and very triggering in uh, different ways. And I think a lot of it, too, you think about it, we're in a current climate where it's heightened so much right now. It's kind of the constant news, um, the constant conversation, which, you know, we're not trying to downplay the conversation needs to be had around this. So I don't want to say that. But I do just want to say that it's created a little angst in both Terry and I, and we feel that Um, While it's definitely important for us to share these stories of these women and highlight who they are and not just highlight what happened to them, um, we want to do that in a a way where we feel we're in a better mental space, where we can talk about it in a better light, like we'll have a little bit more control of our own emotions and And we're in a better headspace for this conversation. We've decided collectively, Terry and I, that we just want to take a pause for a moment, Um, not ending the series at all, because we will forever say their name, Mm -hmm. but we just want to pause for a moment and pick up, we'll pick up on the series in the future um, and other installments as we um, we're actually preparing to wrap season two, so um, we'll probably continuously pick these up um, in the upcoming season. But um, I just wanted to share that this is not an easy conversation to have. This is not, you know, we didn't realize how this would impact us in this yeah. way when you're having to research and basically relive these moments over again. And right. also when you're seeing that the common narrative or the common conclusion of a lot of these stories is that they didn't really see true justice. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just very hard. Um, we're, we're, we're being very transparent with y'all. This is not easy for us. And not saying that we're here just to do the easy work because we have the hard conversations on here, but we do want to make sure that we know when it's time for us to pause, take a step back, reflect, and take care of our mental space. And mm-hmm. that's all that we're saying here is that we just need to pause for a moment. We have a few names today that we... Um, we're going to share and highlight, and um, again, we'll forever say their name. Yeah, um, and so without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and get started. So the first young lady who um, I will be sharing about is Rakia Boyd. She was 22 years old, um, and before I go into this, you know, 
Yanni and I said this in the previous episode, but you know, it's, it's definitely difficult to find information about these women to humanize them. So I, I apologize if there's a lack of information as far as humanizing these women. I tried to find, but that, you know, the information is very, very minuscule. But anyway, um, Rakia Boyd was born on November 5th, 1989 in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, she moved with her family from, from Chicago South Side to Dalton, Illinois, um, a Chicago suburb. On March 21st, 2012, Boyd was hanging out with her friends at Douglas Park on Chicago's West Side at a party, listening to music and having a few drinks. Around 1 a.m., 22-year-old Boyd and some of her friends walked to a nearby corner store. Around that same time, Servin, who was just finishing his shift on his second job as an was off duty. Servin drove to Douglas Park after Citizen called police about a noise complaint. Servin saw Boyd and her friends and later claimed that they were arguing in an alley. Whether Servin calmly approached Boyd and her friends or was rude and aggressive is still debated, but one of Boyd's friends, Antonio Cross, claimed that Servin attempted to buy drugs from the group. When Cross told Servin to get his crackhead expletive out of here, Servin pulled a gun, stuck it out of the window of his car, and fired into the group, hitting Boyd in the head. She was instantly killed, and Cross was wounded in the hand. After the shooting, the Chicago Police Department defended Servin's actions and arrested Cross. The police department claimed the servant had discharged his weapon after Cross had approached him with a gun. Upon investigation, it was discovered that Cross was holding a what? Cell phone. Mm-hmm. In, no- mm-hmm. In November 2013, servant was charged with involuntary manslaughter, but was cleared of all charges two years later on April 20th, 2015, by Judge Dennis J. Porter following a non-jury trial. On November 24, 2015, Mayor Rahm Emanuel and Police Superintendent Gary McCarthy called for Dante Servin to be fired by the police, Chicago Police Board. On May 17, 2016, Servin resigned from the police force. The city of Chicago also paid $4.5 million to the Boyd family. Boyd's death at the hands of Chicago Police Officer Dante Servin would help inspire the Black Lives Matter movement. Before we go to the next one, I have a powerful quote that um, Rakia Boyd's brother, Martina Sutton, um, made or gave a statement. Um, and he said, they don't talk about women that much when they get killed by the police. They barely talk about women. Why is that? It's crazy because you see that even in death, women play the second role. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we talk about this. I mean, you know, it's not it, even in death. Women play the second role. We talk about that in life um, where we are often often muted and not heard and uh, and silenced or pushed to the background. Um, and it is sad that that even happens to us, even in death. And that is part of why we wanted to do this series. So. Uh, we forever say her name, Rakia Boyd. Yes, Rakia Boyd. Mm. I'm I'm going to share a little bit about um, Yvette Smith. There was a very little that I could find about her personally, so I unfortunately couldn't highlight more about who she was as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, as just a you know, a human in society. So a lot of that won't be shared today. Um, but, you know, I, I did have some information that I can share and especially um, the events that led to her final moments. So um, on the 16th of January, 2014, mother of three, Yvette Smith was shot in her friend's home by Daniel Willis, the officer coming to settle a disturbance. Yvette was seemingly trying to act as a peacemaker doing, during a dispute between a father and a son. She called 911 about a half an hour after midnight. And when the Bastrop County police arrived at the house, one of the men was already waiting in the front yard and the worst of the disturbance had seemed to be over. So again, a disagreement was settled before the officers arrived. 
Um, and the owner of the home, Mr. Willie Thomas, was outside and the police issued verbal commands for other occupants in the home to exit the property. Well, when Yvette opened the door, um, not even three seconds after the door was opened, the officers fired shots at her and Mm -hmm. she was shot twice by the deputy sheriff using his personal AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle. Mm. The officers claimed that Yvette threatened them with a gun despite no weapons being found within the home. Mm -hmm. Um, The dispatcher claimed the opposite and Thomas said it was false um, information, but April um, in April, 2016, Daniel Willis, um, that police officer was um, not found guilty of murder. Mm -hmm. Um, The family later filed for a wrongful death suit and they settled with um, a 1.2 million compensation. But again, Daniel Willis still walks a free man who killed an innocent unarmed black woman and Yvette Smith lost her life. Mm -hmm. So no amount of money can bring back life that was lost. I don't care. This case did raise broad issues about police accountability and questions about police recruiting standards um, and the general conduct of the sheriff's department. I think one fact that I found about the officer was that he had never received formal training for this type of dispute, for like um, that type of call or dispute or whatever. So the fact that he was answering the call. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, we will forever say her name, Yvette Smith. Yvette Smith. Wow. Okay. Um, so my my next young lady that I will be sharing about is Chantel Davis. And same sentiment, uh, you know, the information is is non existent out there for her, but I will be sharing part of her story. Um So on June 14th, 2012, Chantel Davis, a 23-year-old African-American woman, was fatally shot by an NYPD officer, Phil Atkins. She was unarmed and her death occurred while the national discussion of police brutality was gaining publicity in the wake of similar killings. That debate led to the creation of the Black Lives uh, Matter movement the following year. Mm -hmm. Two plainclothes police officers saw Davis driving erratically and pursued her vehicle. Once her car came to a stop after colliding with the minivan, the officers got out of their car and approached on foot. Davis opened her passenger side door, knocking one officer to the ground. Then she got back into the driver's seat. Believing that Davis was trying to drive away, And with the car moving backwards, Detective Phil Atkins reached into her car and tried to shift it into park. While they struggled for control, quote unquote, Atkins shot her once in the chest. When the officers asked her to exit the car (laughs) after she's been shot in the chest, when the officers asked her to exit the car, she stumbled out while bleeding profusely onto the pavement in front of a large crowd. One witness, George Ricketts, said that Davis cried out that she didn't want to die and a woman attempted to comfort her. Mm. Despite paramedics' attempts to revive her, Davis was later pronounced dead at Kings County Hospital. According to East Flatbush residents, the officer who killed Davis had a history of brutality. At the time of her death, her friends and family said that Chantel was trying to get her GED and turning her life around. Um, While police alleged that Davis had been trying to escape when she was shot, several witnesses stated that she was trapped behind an airbag and was not attempting to get away. Mm. In 2017, Chantel's family reports that there have been no investigations into her death or the officer who killed her, despite multiple attempts to follow up with the Brooklyn District Attorney Office. Hmm. We say her name, Chantel 
Davis. Chantel Davis. Mm. He has something. I just the the fact that this man shot her in the chest, and then you you shoot her in the chest, and then you. Yeah. It just some stuff I be feeling like just does not make you the you she you shot her in the chest. Now she's stumbling out of the car, right? Because at this point, I'm sure she's like, somebody help me. Hmm. And you think that she's trying to escape? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Um, this one is more of a recent name, um, as this is something that happened um within the past um six, seven months or so. And um, as with all these stories, they definitely affect and touch us in a way. But this one in particular hits very close to home to Terry and I because it is basically in our home. It's It happened no more than, what, 30 or so miles away from where we are. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about um, a Tatiana Jefferson. A Tatiana had been up late playing video games with her eight-year-old nephew in her final moments leading up to the fatal shooting by um, Officer Aaron Dean, who was standing in her backyard with a, flash, a flashlight and a gun. One key piece of this, he would go on to resign two days later before the police chief actually planned to fire him. Convenient. But, but Jefferson, um, she was 28 at the time of her death. She had graduated from Louisiana's Xavier University in 2014 with a degree in biology, and she worked in the field of pharmaceutical equipment sales. Um, She um, was planning and saving for medical school, and um, she had recently moved in with her mother to care for her mother as her mother was experiencing some health problems. One thing about this, too, her mother was actually in the hospital at the time of her shooting. And Mm -hmm. that's how she 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 was hospitalized for heart problems at the time. And she got the news while she's in the hospital that her own daughter was killed. Mm, mm, mm. In the final moments leading up to the shooting, um, one of Tatiana's neighbors called a non-emergency line at 2.23 a.m. on um, this particular Saturday. Um, He called to check on the safety of the residents after spotting that the door was open. Um, two officers responded to the call and they parked a block away from Ms. Jefferson's house and they you know, walked onto the property, unlatched um, a fence door and walked into her backyard. And according to an arrest warrant affidavit, Jefferson told her nephew who she was playing, you know, video games with at the time, she heard someone outside before the shooting took place and she told them like she heard someone wrestling in yeah. the backyard right. so she went to get her handgun uh, from her purse right and so. dean um the officer who never identified himself as a police officer yelled for jefferson to put her hands up and then fired through the window killing Tatiana. Mm-hmm. Um, as previously stated, um, Aaron Dean, the officer, resigned before he could be fired. He was um, arrested, um, and in December of last year, December 2019, he was indicted by the Texas grand jury for murder. However, the trial right now has been delayed due to due to the coronavirus pandemic. So. Mm-hmm. We are definitely hoping and praying that true justice justice is served in this case and they get it right this time. But even at the end of the day, a Tatiana will never be able to become, you know, achieve that dream of becoming a doctor. Yeah. She would never be able to help save and care for other lives. She would never get to play another video game with her nephew 
Yeah. Um, there's nothing that can bring her back and allow her to complete the the story that was unwritten yeah. for her. So her mother did say this when officer, well, ex-officer Dean was um, indicted. In her words, she said, my God, I was so happy to know that the man that shot and killed my daughter is going to be indicted for murder. She went on to say that justice was served on that part, but I know we got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that they finally indicted that man on murder because he murdered my baby. Mm. So... We'll forever say her name, a Tatiana yeah. Jefferson. A Tatiana Jefferson. And I just want to add to that, if I'm not mistaken, not even a full month, if that, maybe a month after Tatiana's life was taken, her father passed away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. After that, um, and I don't know, was it a heart attack or... I think it was. Um, yeah, I mean, he or, died of a broken, broken heart. heart. Yeah. 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 Another key thing about this case was, um, and we keep him lifted in in prayer and in spirits and good spirits, because I know I can, just can't imagine the nephew into space that he's in that weight that he's carrying. Um I won't say his name because I just don't. Want oh, him. not the nephew. I'm sorry. No. Well, the, the, nephew the guy too. that the, yeah, the, the guy that yeah, yeah. Yes, um, the guy. He, well, yeah, the nephew too because he was there. And he experienced that. Oh my yeah. gosh, that's yeah. his last memory of his aunt. Right, at eight that's years old. his probably his introduction of police. So mm. you think about the work that has to be done in that child's mind. Yeah. Um. But the gentleman that actually made the non-emergency call, um, there was something I was reading where he shared about how, you know, Tatiana had moved, had recently not too long moved into that home with her mother. Um, her mother had bought that home not too long, maybe about two so years, two or three, I forgot how many years it was. Mm -hmm. um, he was basically kind of like a lifelong resident in that area. He was so proud of their space. He made sure that yards were cut and he used to always go over there and talk to them. And he shared about how he would cut their yard and Tatiana will always come out there and talk to him and will offer him water and help well, while, he, while he's mowing their lawn. And on the actual day that she was shot, she was teaching her nephew how to mow the lawn and you wow. know, giving him lessons of, you know, growing up to be a man. Um, and he said he watched it, but he was like, um, he said he did want to call the police because of so many things prior to a Tatiana's case that, um, that made him a little leery. Um, yeah. and he was like, he fought against that feeling and he was like, he carries guilt to this day for making that call because he's like, he felt like he had his hand in basically her being murdered mm. every new case that has that comes on, I mean, that has taken place since then. He's like, it's like a looming um, reminder of her and hmm. how she was taken. And so I just pray that just for him and, you know, his peace and his peace of mind. And cause that yeah. I can't imagine, you know, having. That's feeling. heavy. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to yeah. kind of wanted to share that too. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's that is very very real. I mean, yeah, I'm sure he's playing scenarios over and over in his head. Like maybe he's thinking, maybe I shouldn't have went and checked. Maybe I should, you know what I'm saying? I shouldn't have called, you know, emergency services to check yeah, the welfare check. Right, because he, you know, he knew that the mother had health problems, and he was thinking the person that was coming out on the stretcher was the mother. He thought oh. was, you know, that. You know something that happened to her. He didn't know. So that he the didn't mother know. Was, he didn't know the mother was in the hospital at the time. Oh my goodness! Ugh, the trauma, oh. the trauma, the yeah. trauma yeah. of it all. People don't realize the repercussions of your actions. I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about when you decide to take life or death in your own hands and you make this choice, the repercussions go far beyond a person whose life was lost. 
It affects so many people around them. It affects people outside of their circles. As you can see, it's affecting every Black person in America right now. Yeah. And across the world. These things have, like, my goodness. But until people start to care, you know. Yeah. So, um, y'all, all we just ask is that, you know, definitely keep these families lifted and your prayers if you pray if you know you want to send warm thoughts or wishes whatever but definitely keep them and 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 these women on your mind and hearts because yes. they their lives matter that's right I didn't want to say this part, but um, I think this is another piece of why Terry and I just need to kind of take a break from this um, series for just for for the moment is because, you know, I think what made this such a hard thing for us is because, you know, when you do a series, you know, like there is an end in sight. Mm -hmm. That means when there's an end there, there's that's the end of it. You know, there's yeah. no chance of it happening again. Right. Um, and so when, when you are sharing stories of this and it's still happening, it's, it's, it's like, well, how many things do we have to say? Right. Right. Literally. We're like, still we... on names from years and years ago. And there's something that happened yesterday. Yes. Like, I, I, I can't. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this this yesterday um, and really kind of trying to not even put a nail in the coffin, but just kind of making a deciding factor. It's like, do we do we stop the series now? And it, like this kind of like dichotomy that was going on. I know for me, it was like, bruh, like you just said, there are so many names <laughs> that even if, we continue the series, which in itself makes me upset because of the fact that we're even having to do a series about Black women who, number one, have their lives have been taken um, at the hands of law enforcement and there's been no justice served. Uh, and number two, that these names are not known and not talked about. Um, and the fact that there, like you just said, Yana, there was not going to be really... Any end in sight? Because why? This keeps happening over and over and over. And we are tired. Honestly, we are tired. And we've literally done two episodes in this series. Yeah. And and just we're like, okay, well, do we just continue to say their names? It's like, Lord, there are so many names. And the list has not ended. The list keeps getting longer. Yeah. So that in itself is like, man, like just to make it real simple, like that's trash. It's really a trash situation. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We don't want to be doing this. We don't want to do this. We can barely get through two, two, two episodes in the series because we just, it's not even, it's not good for our health. It's not good for our mental. It's too much. I don't know, but <sighs> yeah. Um, this is definitely heavy. It's hard. So um, with that said, like we said, we'll forever say their names. Um, but for right now, we're going to press the pause button on this. And I guess until next time, y'all. Melanate on that. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed our chat today. Keep the conversation going by heading to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leaving us a review. Have a story of your own to share? Email us at info at melanatedconversations.com or connect with us on social media at Melanated Conversations. Till next time, keep raising your voice. voice.